Hello, everyone. I would like to thank this opportunity to uh, speak to you about centrosomes in development and evolution and disease. My name is Monica Ptin Cordias, and I'm a group leader at Instituto Gulbenkian de Ciencia, uh, close to Lisbon uh, in Portugal, in Oeiras. So in our group, we are really fascinated by how cells are organized in space and time. So how do they execute such diverse functions such as a nerve cell, a bone cell, skin or blood? And in particular, we, we are very interested in a small structure in our cells called the centrosome, which is composed of centrioles and which is very important actually to uh, many different functions in our cells. And in particular to also organize the skeleton that then defines uh, polarity and the organization of structures in space and time. So these are very tiny structures, the central that I was just showing you and here in a scheme. They are made of nine triplets of microtubules uh, that are shown here and they have two very different personalities in our cells. So they can form the centrosome where you have two of them, which with material that surrounds the centrioles actually helps to anchor and nucleate microtubules. And these are important for cell division, cell polarity, cell migration, and, uh, and also cell signaling. But this structure can also tether to the membrane where they nucleates the formation of cilia and flagella that are very important for um, signaling and also for a motility such as in the sperm flagella. So at this moment in time in your body, you, these structures are having many different functions from sensing the light in your receptors, in your eyes, to expelling particles in your trachea, to uh, cilia in many different parts of our, your body, the hypothalamus, sensing whether you've eaten enough, your kidneys, but also the centrosomes in cells either in division or in interface organizing the skeleton. And because of these multiple functions, they actually uh, are involved in many different diseases. For example, if you have changes in the genes that code for uh, centrosome uh, proteins, then actually can have diseases of development such as microcephaly where people have a small brain as compared to the wild type. Uh, it's uh, known also that the Zika virus can change uh, centrosomes in cells. We also know that uh, changes in centrosomes are very common in tumors. And actually that uh, if you alter centrosome number, you can induce tumors in mice. And it's also known that if you change uh, cilia, you can have many different diseases, including uh, cystic kidneys, uh, retinal degeneration, obesity, multiple fingers. So there are many different uh, symptoms that are associated with uh, different diseases depending on the molecules that are affected. So actually these structures were found really long ago by these uh, famous biologists. And already at that time, they were asking some of the questions that we are still asking today, such as uh, what is the role of these structures uh, in human disease? What is their role in cells? but also how are they inherited. But it was only in the last 15 years or so that uh, uh, we started to have the tools to address some of these questions because these structures are really small. And with the advent of genomics, uh, comparative genomics, um, microscopy, uh, sensitive proteomics, we started to have a list of the molecules and RNAi screens, a list of the molecules that are needed to form these structures, uh, central and cilia toolkit, which actually it's very interesting because these are present in many different organisms in the eukaryotic tree of life that have these structures. So which suggests that the last common ancestor of, of these eukaryotes already had these structures and they were coded by the same molecule. So this would be a, a pathway that is 2 billion years old. So there are many different questions in particular in our lab, we're very interested in several of them, including principles of central and cilia biology. So how you define the number of these structures, how you define the structure such as length, how you define how are they assembled in space and time, but also how you break some of these rules to generate diversity within a single organism so that you form different structures in different tissues within evolution, but also in human disease. So how, do, how are they altered in human disease and contribute to human disease? And some of these questions, as I said, are old questions. So already Van Beneden and Bovary 
were already discussing how the centrosome is formed and suggesting that it is an inherited structure. Uh, and when you have fertilization, the egg does not have centrosomes, but it would be the sperm that would bring its space, a centrosome that would be needed so that the new organism is formed with centrosomes. However, it was also known uh, that actually uh, some certain organisms can develop without fertilization. And this is uh, what is called virgin birth. So you have no fertilization, you have development of an organism, which would suggest that centrosomes could form de novo without template. And so these were two opposing views of whether the centrosome was a continuous structure being transmitted from generation to generation, or whether they would form uh, de novo. This is a question that has remained for a long time, but now we actually have studied many different organisms and we know that this might not be exclusive. So, so you have certain cells like our cycling cells where you have you start the cell cycle with uh, one cell with, with um, two centrioles in a centrosome and then they duplicate so close to the one that already exists, existed almost like a template where you have new centrioles forming there that will elongate. So that in mitosis, you have two centrosomes, each one with two centrioles in a highly coordinated fashion. And this is a, the, what you call canonical way. But at the same time, certain organisms, uh, the wasps, for example, can develop without fertilization. And so centrosomes form de novo. But there are also other organisms where cells normally do not have centrosomes. They only form them to generate the sperm like the mosses and then they, they form centrioles that will form the, the flagella that is needed for cell motility. So there are different things here that uh, uh, contrast. So these guys are regulated by the cell cycle. They form close to a centriole. It's one and only one per centriole. Here, the timing, we don't really know. It may depend on what type of cell we are talking about. The location is not very clear where they form and the numbers it really depends on the species, can be very controlled, like for example in mosses, or it can be very uh, diverse, like for example in human cells when you remove centrioles and they form de novo. And, and, and this is uh, uh, actually something that you can see in many different organisms, as I was telling you. So you can have uh, uh, de novo, for example, in flatworms. You can have also de novo in different plants. Uh, so, and you can have the novel in different parts of the karyotic tree of life. But also you can have the novel in human cells. So if in human cells, you ablate centrioles either by using a laser and you kill the centrosome effectively, or you prevent the centrosome from forming new ones by preventing or inhibiting uh, the trigger of centriole biogenesis, then you have a cell without centrioles and if you now uh, actually uh, remove this uh, inhibitor, then you can allow centrioles to form. And actually in this case, many of them will form the novo, so there is no control of the novo formation. So the question is, uh, are they different processes, uh, the canonical and the de novo, but you have in the same cell, you can form de novo, but if you can also uh, form in a templated fashion, so this would be the same cells. And how is this process regulated in space and time? So already a while ago, when we were studying a trigger of central biogenesis called pololycanase 4, which is a molecule of the pololycanase family, which are protein kinase important for cell cycle progression. So this molecule, we knew it's actually necessary for central formation, and if you have too much of it, you form many centrioles. And what we saw was very interesting. So this is an egg of the fly, it's an fertilized egg. So you only see the products of meiosis and you are seeing it because they are labeled with tubulin. So tubulin is labeled. If you fertilize this embryo, you have the first spindle in the first mitosis and you have the two centrioles at each pole forming the centrosome. If you now have uh, too much PLK4, which is a trigger of mitosis, what you can see is that you start seeing a lot of centrioles forming the novo, and you see the centrioles here by lateral microscopy. And, but if you already are fertilized, you see that the centrioles form close to the one that already exists. So this suggests that again, the same cell can form them de novo or uh, in this canonical fashion, but also that uh, if the centrioles are present 
new centrioles will form close by, suggesting that the centriole either recruits molecules, it works as a catalyzer so that new centrioles form close by, or it inhibits other structures from forming elsewhere. So a while ago, looking into the regulation of PLK4, we saw that uh, actually PLK4 auto-activates in, in a trans fashion. So PLK4 phosphorylates another PLK4 molecule in this T loop, which is important for kinase activation. So normally PLK4 has a low activity, but when it encounters another PLK4 molecule, they can phosphorylate itself and it can become active. So normally you'd have, uh, uh, if you look at total levels of PLK4, at low levels, the probability that these molecules encounter is low and therefore there's very little PLK4 which is active. But if you give more PLK4 to the cell, you will have an increase in PLK4 activity because then these molecules start to encounter themselves. And this uh, suggests that <coughs> there would be a critical threshold and that if when you overcome this threshold, then centrioles could be formed. And perhaps this threshold would be lower if you have a centriole because molecules such as PLK4 would be recruited there. And then you have this positive feedback loop where PLK4 activates PLK4. There are also some other positive and some negative feedback loops and centrioles would be formed there. And if there is no central, you would expect that you need more PLK4 to accumulate so that you start having these positive feedback loops occurring in the cytoplasm, even without centrioles there. So is it the same molecular pathway? And how is it controlled, encoded? What ensures the right structure? Uh, already uh, a while ago, using comparative genomics, our group and other groups have looked into uh, some of these molecules that are needed to form centrioles. So the trigger of centriole biogenesis, it's actually only, uh, only exists, PLK4 only exists in um, opistocons, so fungi and animals, and it might be substituted by a different uh, molecule in other organisms, such as even the founder of that family, PLK1. But other molecules that are needed to form the structure of the centriole actually exist in many of the different organisms that have centrioles, and they're only absent from genomes that do not have these structures, suggesting that uh, whether you form centrioles de novo or in a canonical fashion, uh, you would use the same molecules. We also know that when we uh, uh, allow cells to form centrioles de novo, they need these molecules. And if you allow them to form them in canonical fashion, they also need these molecules, suggesting that the same pathway is involved. And we also know now that uh, the, these similar molecules are involved uh, even if you look uh, in, in plants and if you look also in different animals, which suggests again that similar pathways are involved. So it would be not two different uh, mechanisms, but uh, a similar mechanism should be involved in this canonical way of forming centrioles or uh, de novo, whereby you use this complex pathway with many different molecules and centrioles would be self-assembling whether here or here. And that uh, uh, if you have a centriole, components will be recruited there. You have a positive feedback loop that makes that centrioles are formed there. If you don't have centrioles, and if you have high levels of these molecules, you could have positive feedback loops occurring in the cytoplasm and there are new centrioles forming. So an, an interesting question is really how you regulate this process, for example, how you regulate numbers, but also how you create different numbers and diversity. So I told you that this process of central formation is highly coordinated with the cell cycle. And in fact, we know that the cycle independent kinases that regulate the cell cycle also contribute to regulate this process. For example, CDK1 is very important here to prevent centrioles from forming here. So they only form at this stage. But also this cycle is a cycle whereby you normally would produce two centrioles and cells would be born with two centrioles. Yet we see that there are certain cells in our body that show themselves without these structures. So the question is what, what is happening to these structures? And this is also interesting because as in the case of the eggs, this could have uh, an important function, the fact that these structures are not there or are eliminated. Because we know that in Xenopus, so frog eggs, so here they don't have centrioles, but if you actually inject a centrosome there, they can form um, 
develop into an embryo and um, a small frog, which suggests that the uh, centrosome is really important and it's important that you eliminate it, otherwise there could be a risk of uh, peritonogenesis. On the other hand, this experiment done in C. elegans also shows that these structures are very stable. So if they disappear, uh, it's strange because they are really stable. So if you label a centrosome uh, in the sperm of a, a, a worm, C. elegans, and then you fertilize, uh, in this paper, it was seen that actually even after 500, when you have 550 cells in the egg, you see that, uh, or in the embryo, sorry, you see that uh, you, you still see the labeled centriole that came from the sperm, which suggests that these are very, very stable structures. So looking into eggs, what we saw was that these centrioles disappear with time during the egg so that you end up uh, with an egg without centrioles. And the, the reason why they disappear is because this uh, matrix that I told you in the beginning and surround centrioles and is important for microtubule nucleation is not only important for microtubule nucleation, but also it's important to protect centrioles from actually being uh, eliminated. And, and therefore, uh, if you, what happens in the eggs is actually these components disappear with time and then centrioles disappear. So this is very important. So it means that the, even though these structures supposedly are very stable, this is not a, a, a process that once you make centrioles, they are stable forever. This is a process where centrioles need to be actively maintained and they can be unstable in certain tissues if, that's, uh, if that makes sense for that tissue. So the other question that is very interesting is how you create the diversity that you observe here. And, and this is work uh, performed in my lab by a variety of different people, including Shadin Jana. And what you can see here is that if you look in a fly, an olfactory in urine that has uh, one cilia here and another cilia here, and the sperm cell where it has a cilia here and another cilia that is perpendicular to it, what you see is that actually these cilia are very, very different. So you have triplets here in the centrioles. These guys have doublets. These are really long. These are very short. These are a longitudinal fashion, fashion. These ones are perpendicular to each other. So there's multiple, multiple differences. These guys have a cartwheel at the base. These guys have no cartwheel. They are very, very different. And we've actually been able to observe that uh, uh, even though there's many different components that are common to uh, the different centrioles, even in different species, what happens when these cells are developing is that they lose some of these components uh, so that actually the, the centrioles at the base of the different cilia uh, have different components or ha actually have some of the common components localizing to different uh, structures, suggesting that this process is highly regulated. And this is actually uh, very interesting and maybe relevant for human disease because we actually see that sometimes the same molecule that um, is uh, important and is what we call a, a core structure, a, a core molecule, a component of uh, the cilia, the cilium. This molecule, when it has mutations in different places, it can generate different diseases. And this makes sense if these different tissues are regulated in the different way, if the molecule is regulated different ways in different tissues. Therefore, different mutations could give rise to different uh, phenotypes. The other very interesting thing is not just when you look within one organism and you look at these structures, for example, here a transition zone, but if you look at also different species uh, of organisms, you can actually see that uh, these structures can also be very different. And this is very nice showing that there is also a lot of uh, interspecies variation and not just intraspecies variation. So the, finally, I, I would like just to, to discuss a bit this role of uh, centrosomes in human disease. And this is something that was actually suggested long ago by Theodore Bovary uh, that uh, centrosomes could cause cancer. And in recent years, people have seen that in many different cancers actually show deregulated centrosome numbers and that uh, uh, changes in centrosomes can actually lead to tumor formation in mice. We've actually seen that uh, uh, if you have, uh, if you pick different uh, cells from uh, different um, uh, tumor types uh, and, and you look at centrioles, this is a wild type cell, 
you can see that in, in different tumors in different cell lines, you can see many different centrosomes, for example, or even really long centrosomes. And we've actually observed that this irregulation is quite common, as I'll show you here in work that we have done looking at the N size 60 panel of cancer cell lines, uh, whereby um, if you look at the percentage of cells that show central amplification, uh, so these are cells with more than eight, reals, say eight centrioles per cell, or cells that have five to eight centrioles per cell, which is also not normal. The normal is up to four, looking at mitosis. And you can see here that uh, uh, in many different cell lines that are cancer cell lines in a panel of cancer cell lines that is called the NCI-60 panel of cancer cell lines. Uh, and if you compare this with non-cancer cells, we see that many of the cancer cell lines uh, actually have centrosome deregulation in numbers and also in size. It's very interesting that if you look at breast cancer, you see that the breast cancer that is less invasive luminal has less amplification as compared to the more invasive basal uh, breast cancer. And we could actually look in tissue samples from uh, uh, breast cancer, and we see the same profile where basal actually shows more deregulation as compared to luminal breast cancer. So to finalize, we think these are very fascinating questions that already these guys were studying. We now have the tools to address these and we can ask questions about how are these structures formed in space and time? How are they maintained? But also how are they uh, formed in different tissues? How do they form in different organisms and can even contribute to evolution? And how do they participate in human disease? So many, many different questions to address and which I didn't have time to address today, but that you can look at many different uh, papers. So I would like to, to thank people in my group that contributed to the work that I've shown here today. Uh, I would also like to say that the work that I've shown in, in cancer has had also had the participation of many different uh, research groups, including the, the group of David Perlman, Susanna Gudinho, Joana Paredes, and, and Nuno Moraes that uh, helped with that particular study. And uh, I would like to thank these organizations for funding. Uh, the work on centrioles was done by, by Shadin from the people that are here, but also Susana Mendonça. Um, and uh, the work on uh, uh, cancer has been done by Gael Martel, Adan Guerrero, Carla also worked on cancer. The work on uh, central disappearance in oogenesis has been done by Anna Marcus here, but also Ines Bent, who is not here, so a variety of different uh, people. And thank you very much uh, for listening. <laughs>